In this lecture, we are going to start our exploration of ancient Greece from chapter 5. Now you're going to see I note this as part 1. I actually decided this chapter has a lot of important information, and so I actually decided to break it up into two separate lectures. That way you don't have one very long lecture. Uh, what we're going to look at in part 1 is we're going to look at the beginnings of ancient Greece up until the classical period and then part two will start with the early uh, classical period of Greece. Now I want you to remember as we're looking at this something to pay close attention to is pay close attention to how the Greeks um, their artwork reflected their cultural beliefs especially in how they saw the role of man. Greeks very quickly developed an art independent artistic style and identity that then became the foundation of the Western tradition in the history of art. The Greek temple has had the biggest and longest lasting impact in architecture. An example is what you see here. This is the Parthenon in Athens on the Acropolis, which we'll talk about later. Actually, it'll be in the second lecture on ancient Greece. But these works of art also became symbols for what the Greeks believed in. Order, harmony, and especially finding this harmony in mathematical harmony. Also, it was a celebration of the greatness of the people of Greece. And we'll talk about, especially when we get to the friezes on the Parthenon, um, that the Greeks became, especially the Athenians, began to see themselves as the same level as the gods. And many believe this was actually an allegory showing the greatness of the Greek civilization over barbarianism. As we go through the chapter, pay attention to how the focus on the human form also is a reflection of this change in ideology. Hint, you will probably talk about this in an upcoming discussion board. Now, they began to see mankind as the measure of all things, and that's going to be an important phrase. Mankind as the measure of all things, not these gods, not these omnipotent gods to be feared of. In fact, the Greek gods were created in human form, but they were immortal. And humans could become gods by performing heroic deeds. Also, as most of us have been told, the concept of democracy was born in Greece. This means the government is led by the people, or the demos. And we have to remember, though, this actually applied to very few people in ancient Greece. For example, in Athens, in 309, there were over 500,000 people living there. Only 309 were male citizens, so that's only about 2% of the population. However, this is a distinctly different idea than having just a king or one central ruler, but we have to remember this democracy of the time, the democracy, you know, government of the people, was a very small and select few. All right, now the Greeks, or the Hellenists as they call themselves, when we look at the Greek world, Greece was made up of independent city-states, or polis or polis is the plural. I'm sorry, polis is the singular. In 776 BCE, the separate Greek-speaking city-states held their first athletic games in common at Olympia. This was an area where it had a sanctuary dedicated to Zeus, who was the king of the gods. And this actually became what was known as the first Olympic Games that still continue to this day. Also a side note, be sure to read both the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus sidebar to become familiar with the gods and goddesses. This will be essential to understanding aspects of the art because sometimes we're just going to talk about, oh, this is an artwork depicting Apollo. And if you don't know who Apollo is, you're going to lose some of the information and the impact of the art. So I would actually... Um, Maybe make yourself a list of some of the most important gods and goddesses. Or if you don't know, have it marked in your book so you can keep going back so you know who's being spoken about. Now the Greeks regarded the citizens of Hellas, which means those who speak Greek, as joined together by a common culture and language 
and they saw themselves as distinct from what they said were the barbarians. And the barbarians were basically anybody who did not speak Greek. The arts would reflect this by showing ideal beauty in the human form. And what we see in the Greeks is this balance of intellectual and physical perfection. And you needed both. You need to both have intellectual ability and physical perfection to achieve an ideal humanistic education. And what we mean by humanistic is human-centered. Again, not focusing on the gods. Some things we do also have to remember about ancient Greece. Uh, slavery was universal for the Greeks. Usually the, it had been those who had been defeated in a military campaign and then their offspring, but not always. And also women were not viewed as equal to men. There we only know of a handful of women artists' names from ancient Greece and all of their works have been lost. And the artworks of the time actually reflect both of these ideas. We'll see artworks with freeborn men and women are often shown with their slaves. And symposiums were also a very popular subject on painted vases. And these were actually dinners where only men and prostitutes could attend. Um, freeborn women would not be allowed there. So we do need to remember these things when we're looking at, you know, the greatness of ancient Greece, that there also was a darker side. Now we're going to begin our exploration of ancient Greece with looking at what's called the geometric and the orientalizing periods. So after the destruction of the Mycenaean palaces around 1200 BCE, we actually saw a decline in the traditional social order. There were no more powerful kings, and this actually resulted in a loss of knowledge. For example, um, knowing how to cut mason masonry how to construct the citadels, tombs, and temples that we've been looking at. Um, this knowledge was lost. It was also a time of depopulation, right? The population actually went down and poverty was widespread. Also during this time period, there was a loss of communication with the world outside. So before we've been talking about, you know, this trade and exploration, that was lost at this time. And this is actually often referred to as the Dark Ages of Greece. However, in the 8th century BCE, economic conditions begin to improve and the population begins to grow again. And this is going to move us into the geometric period or geometric art. Um, geometric art, it's called this because of the use of abstract motif of shapes. And what we're also going to see in this time is the human form is going to return to Greek art. However, this would often be small bronze figurines and paintings on ceramic pots. All right, the first artwork we're going to look at is on the left here, and this is the Dipilon Crater, uh, circa 740 BCE. And a crater, you can think of it as a large vessel. Um, this one was actually, there's not a bottom to it. Uh, many believe so, because this actually marked the grave of a wealthy man who died around 730 BCE. And many scholars believe that it doesn't have a bottom, either to, you know, let rainwater naturally, you know, um, drain out of it, or if somebody poured a libation in there, again, it would naturally drain out. Now, this is a large vessel, and it's over three feet tall. And this is one of the earliest examples of Greek figure painting. Now, we're going to see it has different bands of angular motifs, especially around the top. That is called the meander, and it has the key pattern around the top. Again, that is these geometric shapes. And then there are two large bands which contain human forms. Uh, there are scenes in it where it shows the mourning of a man, which this would make sense if this is marking the tomb. And men and women are shown as different from one another, but the artist was not concerned with showing them as anatomically correct. Also, if you look on the center, um, the horses, they have the correct number of heads and legs, but they all seem to share a body. So again, the artist is not worried about showing you know, horses as they actually are, but for the viewer, us to know and understand, there were many horses here. Now, this marks a significant turning point in the history of Greek art. 
Again, human figures re-enter. Uh, geometric artists also revive the art of storytelling and pictures. We see on this face, it's literally creating a narrative that we, the viewer, can read what is happening through the art. Now, the other image here is a small, solid cast bronze sculpture. And this is actually Hercules and Nessos, who Nessos was a centaur. This shows a man, Hercules, um, sometimes you'll hear him called Heracles, but we often pronounce it as Hercules. And it shows a man fighting the centaur. The centaur, half man, half horse. Again, we're not 100% sure that it's Hercules and Nessos, but because of the popular myth, we believe that is who is depicted here. But again, what's important is it's showing some sort of narrative. And this narrative obviously has to be one that did not happen in real life. We don't have centaurs. What's also interesting, <coughs> excuse me, the centaur is actually a Greek invention. Now this one, if you look at it's interesting, right? It's half man, half horse. Usually the front half is the man, and usually that's from the waist up. However, if you look at this one, the front part, including the forelegs, are human, and the back half is horse. Also in this, the human is bigger than the horse, meaning Hercules is bigger than the centaur, when in real life, right, horses are bigger than men. And so again, this is not to show real life, but was to show that man will be victorious over animal. Again, the idea that in the struggle between man and animals, man wins. Also, both of the figures are shown nude. This, again, is following a Greek tradition. Greek youths would exercise without clothes, and they also competed in the Olympic Games nude. All right, moving on, we're going to move on to the Orientalizing art. Now, it's called this because in the 7th century BCE, the pace and scope of Greek trade and colonization increased, where we had that time where we kind of lost out contact with the outside world. We're seeing that come back. And in fact, the Greeks had more contact with Eastern cultures and artworks, and they started to have a very strong influence of Greek art of the time, especially Egyptian and Mesopotamian art. And so because of this, art historians call it the orientalizing art because art of this period is almost more a reflection of outside or oriental um, areas and not of Greece itself. Examples we see of this, the figure on the left, this is the Manticlaus Apollo, circa 700 to 680 BCE. It is a bronze and it's about eight inches. Now this was dedicated to Apollo by a man named Manticlaus. And we know this because inscribed on the legs in the thighs is the message, quote, Manticlaus dedicated a tithel to the far shooting lord of the silver bow. You, Phoebus Apollo, might give some pleasing favor in return. So literally on it, it's saying this is from Manticos, and he is offering this as a, you know, a gift, a votive to Apollo. Now, we don't know if the figure itself is supposed to be Manticlos or Apollo or even someone else. However, what's interesting is it does show the increased interest that Greek artists had in re reproducing details in human anatomy. So when you look at this form, you can see the pectoral and the abdominal muscles. Also, we see the long hair that is framing the face. So again, more of an interest in showing the human form as it actually is. In the middle is an example of Greece vase painting of this time. Now, Greek vase painting actually required years of training and apprenticeship. And in the 5th and 6th centuries were the height of vase painting in uh, Greek art. Both potters and painters would actually sign their work, and this is showing the pride of the artist. Now, this was unique to Greece, uh, that the talents and abilities of artists to create were celebrated. In fact, many Greek artists actually achieved fame through their art during their lifetime. And this is something we are not really going to see again until the Renaissance and about the 15th century. 
Also, we have what's called uh, Daedalic art. Daedalic art, I'm sorry. This was named after legendary artist Daedalus. And Daedalus's name literally means the skillful one. In fact, legend claims he also built the labyrinth in Crete that housed the Minotaur. Um, early Greeks actually attributed almost all great achievements and sculpture to him. And so that's why this type of art gets its name, that it's all named after him. Example of this is the figure on the right. This is the Lady of Auxerre. Um, it was actually from Crete, but the name Auxerre, that's French because it's the French town at last resided in. Um, however, it was made in Crete and it's circa 650 to 625 BCE, and it's made of limestone, and then it's about two feet, one and a half inches. Now this does show a clothed woman. Um, all women and goddesses of this time were shown clothed. Now we don't know if this individual here, if it's a goddess or a maiden, um, likely it was a maiden because there's no headdress and the hand seems to be in prayer. So it would be, you know, a lady praying to a god. Also, much more naturalistic than earlier works. Um, and, and it's much more naturalistic than the geometric time. So we can even look from here to here and see these changes. Now we do still have abstract shapes within the work. Example, look at the face. The face is very triangular surrounded by long hair however we can still we can see more of the natural form now this was brightly painted as most greek works were um, there's been a modern conception that these were very garishly painted and they weren't they would be brightly painted but it wouldn't be garish also the modern notion that greco-roman statuary was pure white is definitely mistaken all right, next we are going to move into the Archaic period. And this actually is where we're going to see the earliest surviving large scale stone statues of the Greeks. And we're going to see they begin following the Egyptian format. And you see that in the figure on the left. And this is what's called a chorus, which means youth, um, male youth for this one. Well, kind of male. Um, the plural is the chori. And this is one of the earliest examples of Greek life-size statuary art. Often it was made of marble. And you can see on this, think back, the, you know, the figure on that, think back to Egyptian, those Egyptian statues that we look at. And this emulates that idea. It's very rigid. It's fully frontal facing with that left foot slightly forward. The arms are held tight against the body and the fists are clenched. Um, also emulating the Egyptian art, this served as a grave marker, meaning it would stand over a grave, and these would eventually, these sculptures, would replace the large vases and craters that had marked the graves. These also would be used as votive offerings. Now, they do differ from Egyptian sculptures in two ways. First, they were not part of a large stone block. Remember, we talked about how most Egyptian art is technically a high relief because it was attached to either, you know, a background or the base that it was on. And also the Greek art, we see these, the, they are nude. The absence, though, of identifying attributes are formally uh, indistinguishable uh, makes it indistinguishable for the images. We can't tell if they're gods or if they're supposed to represent men. Think back in Egypt, usually there'd be some attribute, something that would tell us, you know, who or what we're looking at. We don't see this in the Greek art. And so again, this is saying, you know, it's this idea, well, it could be this perfect image of a god or it could be the perfect image of a mortal. We don't know. The image on the right is what is known as the calf bearer. This is circa 560 BCE, and it is made of marble, and it has mostly been restored. If you can look, we have it from the knee ups, and this is about five feet, five inches. This was found in fragments on the Athenian Acropolis. And the base, the inscribed base states that Ronibus, who was son of Palos, dedicated the statue to Athena. And so again, this is an offering to Athena. Ronibus is the person carrying the calf. 
we can see he is a um, no longer a youth he has a beard and again this is following the tradition of the nude sculpture but he's also wearing a cape and so what scholars believe that why he's wearing this cape is that he's showing well you know in the tradition of the sculpture it's nude but he's wearing this cape to show that you know as a as a well-respected citizen he would wear clothes the face is also different from earlier Greek statues. If you look closely, you can see he's smiling. From this point on, archaic Greek statues always smile, even at inappropriate times. Now, this does not mean to take this literally. It's not showing like, yay, we're happy. But what it means is that it means that the person portrayed is alive. Okay, so that's what that smile means. All right, next, moving on, we can see again the different developments in the interest in the human form from here to our next two sculptures. Now, this one is the uh, Novisos uh, uh, Chorus, which again means the youth. And this one's circa, this figure on the left, circa 530 BCE, made of marble, and it's six feet four inches. Again, uh, this is of, we know who this individual is supposed to be. This is supposed to be an individual, a young man named Croesus, who died in 530 BCE. And he died a hero's death in battle. So the family erected um, a chorus statue over his grave. And in fact, the inscription of this statue says, Stay and mourn at the tomb of dead Croesus, whom raging Ares, god of war, destroyed one day as he fought in the foremost ranks. And now you can see in this, even moving from these past sculptures to here, we can see this change in the human form. It's rendered much more naturalistically. Uh, the head is not too large for the body. The face is more rounded. In fact, the cheeks you can see are round and not these flat planes. The hair is naturally falling over the back. It's not just these stiff um, coils. And the hips, if you look at the hips and the thighs, they're round and even fleshy. And so what this has done is this makes it look much more like the human form. Again, look at the pectoral muscles and you can see the abdominal muscles and the arm muscles, showing again this interest in the human form and the desire to show the human form more, more realistically, but also in its absolute beautiful, uh, most beautiful form. Also, some paint does remain on this sculpture, giving us a good idea of what it originally looked like. Now, this looking at the more uh, naturalistic form is also true for w statues of women. And you can see that in the sculpture on the right. And this is the uh, Papilios uh, Cora, and this is circa 530 BCE, also made of marble, and it's about four feet high. She is called this because the Kore, which is the young woman, and it thought, it's thought she wore what's called um, a pipilios, which was a simple, long, woolen, bolted garment, belted garment. Um, but what they actually discovered upon looking at it closer, the woman here shown actually is wearing four different garments, one of which only a goddess would wear. And so now scholars believe this is actually supposed to be a sculpture of a goddess. We can't tell which one though. Odds are most likely her left arm and hand would show an attribute that would let us know who this goddess was. But as you can see, that arm has been broken off at the elbow. So an example of this, like say that left arm is out, like say bent at the elbow with the palm up, there would be something in her hand and that would tell us who that goddess was. So for example, if it was an owl, the owl is an attribute of Athena. So we would know it was supposed to be a representation of Athena, but again, this is lost to us. But you can also see here, even though it's this clothed form, the figure is much more naturally shown than previous works. Even we'll go back here to looking at the Lady of Auxerre, 
right? You can see how this is more stiff. The hair doesn't lay as naturally and then compare it to this work. Again, very distinctly different. Now also what's interesting at this time is in the late 6th century BCE, fashionable women in Greece would wear what's called a shitten. And this was a light linen that was worn with a heavier uh, hemation mantle. And artists, sculptors especially, loved creating these works because that lighter kind of flowier fabric they liked showing and copying the elaborate folds and drapes of the lighter material in their works. Um, often they would have the, the core uh, holding part of this, like you imagine like clutching onto your shirt, and to show even more folds and creases in the fabric that they would then render in the sculpture. All right, now we're going to move over to looking at architect and architecture and architectural sculpture. Now, the earliest Greek temples have actually not survived because they were made of wood and mud bricks, so they did deteriorate. But starting in the Archaic period, builders began to use stone, often limestone or whatever material was available. For many areas, marble was actually ready, readily available, so we'll see very many uh, marble structures. Now, the earlier temples were small and simple. In the Archaic Age, the Greek became familiar, the Greeks became familiar with the Egyptian columnar halls, what we looked at. Remember those long halls with columns uh, down them? And so it was then that they began, the Greeks began to build the columnar stone temples that have become synonymous with Greek architecture and again influenced the Western world. Now, I want you to pay attention here. Um, there are two different sidebars in this section. There's the Greek temple plans and Doric and Ionic orders for more information. The image I have here has the Doric and Ionic. Uh, these are two of the earliest Greek architectural styles. And I, if I were you, definitely read both of these sections because um, I can promise you there are gonna be exam questions taken from these. So make sure you do look at those. But for us, for the Greek temple plans, um, again, this insistence on balance and order guided their experiments in how to create these temple plans. The proportions of the temples were very, very important. And from the 6th century BCE, the ratio was usually 1 to 2, meaning that usually the length would be a little longer than twice its width. And you can see that from the image here, right? The length is longer than the width. And it would usually be that one to two. What they wanted to do was to achieve the ideal form through numerical relationships and geometric rules. The altar of the Greek temples actually laid outside the temple at the east end to face the rising sun. So the Greeks, when they gathered to worship, they worshiped outside the temple, not inside. The inside housed the cult statue of, this, of the deity, meaning whatever god the temple was dedicated to. The temples were the houses of the gods, not the followers. And architects and sculptors often worked together to create these massive works, well, soon to be massive works. They designed figural decoration for pediment, um, which was not an easy task. Again, going back here, you can see the pediment is at the top, large triangular shape. Uh, usually we would have high relief, and then eventually we'll have actually freestanding figures in these. And also this awkward triangular shape made it difficult. Um, the artist had to work with that. The central figure was usually very large, and your corner figures would be smaller. Now we're going to see that will change eventually. Sometimes they have what's called a pro, um, a protic figures, and these are ones that protected the temple and wards off evil. From your reading, they talk about Medusa was in the center of one of these pediments, and she was there to protect the temple, and she was there to ward off evil. Often what's called uh, Jigen or Jigen uh, Tamaki 
is a popular theme. And this was actually uh, what this is, is the battle of the gods between the gods and the giants. And this was often seen as a metaphor, and it was a metaphor for the triumph of reason and order over chaos. So the gods defeating the giants, gods, reason, and order over the giants who represent chaos. Now, figural sculpture played a major role in the exterior programs, and they did different things. Um, they would embellish the god's shrine, they would tell the viewers something about the deity, and they would also serve as a votive offering to the god or the gods who the temple was dedicated to. Now, the Greeks usually built the temples on elevated sites. These are often hills above the city. And in fact, the term Acropolis means high city. Now, most sculptural ornamentation, again, was on the upper part of the building, in the friezes, and in the pediments. And now, again, we're going to see both Doric and Ionic orders. Doric is the older, Ionic is actually going to be the middle of the different uh, Greek architecture styles we'll look at. And it's going to be more decorative in nature. Um, Ionic architects also sometimes replace columns with, uh, with free forms with human forms. And so we'll see that actually coming up in the next slide. But what we're looking at here, you can see the floor plan. And then the image here is what's called the Basilica at Pestum. And this is circa 550 BCE, and it's about 80 feet by 170 feet. Now, this is also known as the Temple of Hera 1, because there is another of Temple of Hera that is close by, and they call that Temple of Hera 2. Now, this is an example of an early Doric temple design, but it's actually in a Greek settlement in um, Pestrum, Italy. That's why it gets its name. It was mistakenly be called a basilica because of its unusual design. You can see from the floor plan on the right, there's actually a central row of columns that divide the scylla into two aisles. Because of this, right, this makes sense structurally, right? Maybe they were trying to put a row of columns to help support the roof, but this makes it so there could not be a cult statue with inside. And there are three columns on the antis instead of two, so there was no central doorway. Usually what happens in the Greek uh, temples is st when you're standing outside, uh, you can look through that central doorway straight to the cult statue. You cannot do that in this plan. All right, moving on, we're looking at the Sifninen uh, treasury in Delphi. Now this is not a temple, note I said treasury. Treasury was a building that was actually created and set up by the individual city-states, and it was a place where you could safely store your votive offerings. Um, this is an example of 6th century Ionic architecture. And again, this one has been reconstructed from fragments. That's why the image on the left, this is one that has been uh, computer generated. And what you see here is this one uses those elaborate uh, caryatids, which are where we have those female forms instead of columns. These were actually very rarely used, and it's rare to find them. Now, it is believed that these are generic women, that they're not supposed to be portraits of anybody specific. Also, you can see on this the continuous frieze, uh, the sculpted frieze that goes on all four sides of the building. And in the reconstruction, it's also painted. The image on the right, this is an image of the um, of a, a remnant that has remained, kind of redundant. Um, and the paint you can see is worn off on this. But in the reconstruction, you can see that it is painted. Now, this actually also does show uh, the battle uh, between the gods and the giants. Now, what's also interesting is there were painted labels that identified the different protagonists in the frieze. So you could go up, and if you couldn't figure out who the individuals were, literally they almost had name tags like, this is Apollo, this is this person. And what's interesting with this 
is some of these figures actually held metal weapons in their hands. So think about, you know, as you, if you imagine if you were standing in front of this treasury, you know, how, you know, awe-inspiring it would be and how great, you know, it's showing, you know, the skill and the order and the harmony of the Greek pe uh, people. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna look at in this section is vase painting. Now, by the mid sixth century, Athens became the export market for what's called black figure painting in ceramics. What we're looking at on the left here is this Francois vase. Uh, it dates circa 570 BCE. And it's two feet, two inches high. Now, it's called the Francois vase because it was named after the excavator who actually found it. And it was in hundred, uh, hundreds of fragments, and so it's been reconstructed. And so as you look at it, it's the image on the left here, you can look at it and you where there's those blank spaces, that means the fragment was lost. Um, this is considered the masterpiece of early Athenian black figure painting. This is, again, what's called a crater, one of the large vessels. But what's different with this, you can see it's got uh, the two volute-shaped handles. Also, what's interesting, the signature of the painter, uh, Cletius, uh, and, and the potter, Ergotimus, are both on it twice each. And what's funny is that they actually say, like, Cletius painted me and Ergotimus made me. And again, this appears twice. Also on this, there are more than 200 figures in five registers. There were labels for humans, for the animals, and even some of the inanimate objects within it. And this is also a selective encyclopedia of different Greek mythology um, being pictured on it. It includes Peleus and his son Achilles. Achilles is the main figure in the Iliad. And Theseus, the legendary king of Athens, is also portrayed on this. Um, next to this, we have a vase that was created by Exechius. And he was considered the master of black figure painting technique. An example is the vase we see here. And this is Achilles and Ajax playing a dice game, circa 540 to 530 BCE, and it is two feet high. Now, he actually signed this as both the potter and the painter. And what he did is a little different. Instead of having these several bands with different images on it, he placed these large figure figures in a single framed panel. Um, much of classical Greek art shows action, but in archaic art, this was actually largely absent. Literally think this is the calm before the storm. And so what we're looking at here, Achilles and Ajax, both famed warriors, Greek warriors uh, from the Iliad, what we see them here is they're actually playing a dice game. They're, you know, um, passing the time. Now, you can see Achilles on the left has his helmet on. Both are holding their spears and their shields are nearby. So they are ready for action, but again, they're passing the time playing a dice game. And you can look, if you want to zoom in on the, the slide, you can see the extraordinary detail created in this work in the intricate uh, carving of the patterns in the figure's cloaks and their shields. All right, then we're going to move on to what's called red figure painting. And this was actually a new technique that offered more flexibility. The creation of this is credited to Andosides, um, which was a painter, and, and what's well, the Andosides painter. And this is assumed to be an anonymous painter who decorated the vases that were created by the potter Andosides. However, some believe Andosides was actually both the painter and the potter, but we don't have any definitive proof of this. Now what's interesting is you can clearly see the difference between black figure painting and red figure painting by looking at what's called bilingual vases, and that's what we see here. 
These are vases that are created using both the black figure and the red figure technique. So what we see here on the left, again, these are both reproductions of the Achilles and Ajax vase, but on the left, we have the black figure, and on the right, we have the red figure vase. Now, red figure is the opposite of black figure. It uses the same black glaze, but instead of creating silhouettes, the painter uses outlines to create the figures and then the black as the background. Also, the red figure painter uses a soft brush and not a stiff metal graver to draw the interior de details. Also, with the red figure glaze, you can dilute the glaze and create kind of a golden brown hue. And so the red figure painting actually gives the artist a little more freedom um, within the works to create it. All right, and then as we're looking, transitioning from the archaic to the classical period, we can see the transition from the archaic world to the classical world in a single building. And this is the temple of Afua in Greece, circa 500 to 490 BCE. Now, this was a building that started in the archaic period. And what's interesting, though, is even in the uh, 10 short years from the creation of the West Pediment or the East Pediment, I'm sorry, West Pediment to the East Pediment, we see this change in from the archaic world to what we consider the classical world. Now, as we've been going through the archaic world, we've been looking at how the portrayal of the human form has changed, how it's become more and more realistic. Well, what we're going to see in the classical world, that's going to be taken even further. And we can see this by looking at two different sculptures that were in the two different pediments of this temple. They are both showing a dying war, warrior, and again, they were only created 10 years apart. But look at the top one. This is from the West Pediment, and this is the archaic one. Here you can see the torso is still rigidly frontal. The dying warrior is looking directly at the viewer, and he still has that archaic smile, even though there's an arrow literally in his chest. And he looks like he's been arranged, right? That he's almost being staged. You know, I think your book makes a comment of, you know, imagine like a mannequin in a store window. Because imagine, like, if you just got shot in the chest with an arrow, is this how you're going to lay? Probably not. And so why that human form? Again, we can see the pectoral, the abdominal, the leg muscles. It is much more naturalistic. How it's portrayed is not. And then when you compare that to the figure in the east pediment, again, this is a dying uh, warrior, the posture is much more natural and complex. The torso is placed at an angle to the viewer. And here we see the warrior is reacting to the wound as a real human would. You know, he knows death is coming. And we actually also see action in this, where the top one's just kind of like staged, it's, a, it's posed. This one, if you look at it, he's actually struggling to rise. He's using his shield to try to help him lever himself to try and get up. And again, he does not look at the viewer here. And then also even just look how the legs are. Um, even the bottom leg kind of draping over the side of a pediment this seems much more naturalistic as if, you know, a warrior fell down and he's struggling to get up. So again, we see this action in the works that we did not see in the archaic works. Okay, so we will, this will end the lecture of part one, and then we will pick up in the next lecture with part two, starting with the classical period of ancient Greece.